Welcome everyone. My name is uh, Charlotte Kukundakwe and I work as the outreach coordinator with the Kansas African Studies Center at the University of Kansas. Um, welcome to this session titled Benin as a window into the complexity of West Africa. And uh, the presenter for this session is Madison Aubrey. <clears throat> Madison Aubrey is a second year PhD student at University of California, LA, studying archaeology and anthropology in Africa Town, Alabama. Through comparative studies and community led work, she works to connect the founders of this free black town in the deep south to their ancestors in West Africa and to honor the wishes of their descendants in the present day. She is a graduate of Columbia University, a Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellow, and an D of the National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellowship Program. Madison, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try and share my slides right now. So give me a second, because you know, often technology doesn't work as we wish it would. But let's see, can you all see that? Yes, we can. Ooh, we can see I'm, that. I'm giving my stuff away. Let me just pull up my notes on the side of this. Oh, my notes don't wanna pull up. Okay, I'll be able to figure it out. But when I am here, are you still just seeing my um, slides? Yes. yes we can see okay, it. perfect. Mm -hmm. It might be a little choppy, but we'll figure it out. Um, so I just want to say hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank you so much for having me here and attending this session. As a student and young academic, it's not often that I'm given such a platform. So I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your day to be here in this virtual space with me. Today, I'll be speaking about Benin and its relationship to my own work and the time I spent there last summer. My name is Madison Aubie. I'm a second year PhD student studying archeology span in the anthropology department at UCLA. As my bio stated, I study Africatown, Alabama, which you may have heard about um, in Zora Neale Hurston's Barracoon, the story of the last black cargo, in which she interviewed Cujo Lewis, a resident of Africatown. In my own work, by using comparative studies, um, community-led practice, I aim to connect the founders of this free black town, as was stated in the deep south, to their ancestors in West Africa and honor the wishes of their descendants in the present day. A huge question that guides my work is how you might better understand the African diaspora, both in the US and the Americas, as well as in Africa, um, and how we can break down notions of the black monolith, whether that be on one of the two continents. As the title of this talk suggests, the avenue through which I'm gonna be talking about this question today is Benin. First, however, I wanted to talk about how my work took me to Benin in the first place. And for that, we're gonna start at the end or the landing point of a ship named the Clotilda. There we go. The Clotilda was a ship captained by a man named William Foster and owned by a man named Timothy Mayer that in 1860, which was 52 years after the transatlantic slave trade was actually outlawed, um, carried 110 captives aged five to 28 from Weta Benin to Mobile, Alabama here in the States. Due to massive amounts of corruption and the general sentiments in the deep south towards slavery at the time, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, the ship was able to deliver those captives and Timothy Ayer, Mayer was subsequently able to sell them for profit despite all these laws banning the import of people at the time. The individuals that survived this journey worked as slaves for the next five years until the Emancipation Proclamation established their legal freedom. And it was at this point that the larger portion of those 110 individuals, um, they had still spent the majority of their lives in West Africa and were desperate to make it back home. So they reconvened at the site of their landing point in Mobile and demanded Mayer provide them a ship to sail back to West Africa. It, and I think something that's sort of important to keep in mind here is that at this point, they saw themselves less so as Africans in America and more so as Africa, as sorry, they saw themselves less so as African Americans and more so as Africans in America. But when it became clear that Mayer would provide no such transport, they band together and raised money to buy a plot of land um, from him, which would become Africa Town, which was an autonomous community with its own land, customs, and political organization. My own research focuses less on their voyage, even though their voyage has garnered a lot of public attention because it is the last known slave ship to have ever entered the US, 
Um, but I'm more interested in the archaeological on what the archaeological record can tell us about how these individuals held on to their traditions and practices within this new environment post emancipation. I'm really in interested in understanding how traditions persisted and developed given the new constraints of their environment and the differing materials they had access to. I'm interested in how they preserved and asserted their identity as free black individuals in opposition to the white population of Mobile at the time, but also how they preserved and asserted their identity as Africans in America, as opposed to their African American peers at the time, because many of the, those African American peers, their families had been in the States for generations. Um, considering that I'd like to get onto the Benin part of this all sooner rather than later, I'll just offer one example of the type of things that I look for when studying this in my own dissertation work. I spent this last summer in Mobile, Alabama, counting and cataloging the collection of artifacts that have already been recovered from the Africa Town site and are now held in curation facilities at the University of South Alabama. I ended up counting and cataloging over 9,000 artifacts, which is much more than I planned for. And that process just consists of going through bags, washing artifacts that haven't been washed yet, um, weighing them, measuring them, and counting what they are for either their form or the material that they're made out of. One of these 9,000 artifacts that I counted and cataloged was this coin, which can be seen here. Um, as you can see, it's quite rusted from being in the soil of Mobile, Alabama, which is the rainiest city in the country um, for quite some time. And I know that for most of us, our first instinct is to try and squint really hard and make out what that writing says. So I'll just go ahead and do that for you. Um, and even though not all the text is clear, it pretty clearly does say sales tax token. So a little background on that. Um, sales tax tokens were implemented by a couple states in the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s. As a response to the Great Depression, they were issued by private firms, municipalities, and certain state governments, Alabama being one of those. And they were a way for consumers to avoid being overcharged a full penny on a purchase that might have only cost a nickel or a dime. They were often issued in multiples of a mill, which is one tenth of a cent. And I mean, this is interesting, but it doesn't necessarily work to answer my previously stated question or contribute to my interests in the founder of Africatown specifically, um, because while many of them were still alive at this time, there's nothing incredibly unique about them owning a sales tax token. What is unique about this token, however, is its form. Um, so work done by other archaeologists, so sort of a comparative study at the Locust Grove Plantation in Kentucky has shown that often in slave quarters, coins, especially those with pre-drilled holes, such as the sales tax token on the left and this Chinese coin on the right, um, which was found in Kentucky in slave quarters, were strung onto amulet style necklaces mimicking West African traditional forms of protective ornamentation. Though further research would need to be done to confirm the hypothesis that this tax token could have potentially been used in such a way, looking at this token as a potential form of divine cultural protection with deep ties to the founders' spiritual lives back in West Africa, but manifesting in the materials available to them in the Deep South is just one example of this like sort of culturally conscious way that I try to study these materials. That being said, I'm not West African or specifically Beninwa myself, and this cultural consciousness is one that I need to learn as it is not in any way innate to my identity. And that brings us to Benin. This past summer, I was invited by Professor J. Cameron Monroe from UC Santa Cruz to Benin. He was aware that my work had direct ties to Benin given that all the members of Africatown, founding members of Africatown had come from there and offered me a teaching assistant position for the archeological field school he was running for a group of HBCU students. And the way that this sort of works is there's a program called UC HBCU. Um, so students from HBCUs, given that many HBCUs don't have archeology span or even anthropology departments, are able to do a six week program um, with UC professors at different sites. So this summer they spent three weeks in St. Croix and then three weeks in Benin. Um, Benin is located, for anyone who might not know, um, between Togo and Nigeria on the historical slave coast of Africa. Though it's not a hugely popular tourist destination, its capital, Porto Novo, and two large neighboring cities, Cotonou and Ouida, um, boast colonial architecture, coastal views of the Atlantic, and large swaths of palm lined beaches with intermediate monuments, such as Le Port de Non Retour, or the Gate of No Return, um, which all serve as pretty sobering reminders of the cities and the nation's history. Though this literal gate was not there at the time of slavery, 
it is made to sort of symbolize this passage through this gate and the knowledge that these people had that when they were passing through this gate and passing across these beaches, they were never going to return to their homes. Though I had been to the continent previously when I went to Benin, I had both I had visited both Morocco and Kenya prior to this trip. There was certainly an eeriness I felt as I prepared for my first big trip post COVID lockdown to West Africa. Perhaps it was all the reading I had done prior in relation to Africa Town or Sadia Hartman's book, Lose Your Mother, which is very good and I recommend it to all. Um, and that book discusses the deep kinship-based familial trauma that the transatlantic slave trade and, sla and chattel slavery in the Americas produced. But I couldn't help but shake the notion that I might cross paths with some phantom cousin on the streets of Ouida, someone who in some other timeline I might have known and not be able to recognize them. It was definitely having entered into this world of the archaeology of enslaved peoples, it was disconcerting to think about returning to this space. I departed from LAX for the city of Cotonou on the 9th of July, 2022, the 162nd anniversary of the Clotilda's arrival in Mobile, Alabama. This confluence of dates was not planned. I hadn't even scheduled my own flights, but as I sat at the Air France gate waiting to board the flight to Paris, to then wait and board the flight to Cotonou, I, it began to fully set in the realization of what it might mean to return to West Africa on that exact same day, just a century and a half later. Much like Sadia Hartman's text, Lose Your Mother, my experience in Benin began as the stranger, except instead, except, uh, sorry, except instead of Obruni, I apologize for my pronunciation, I've never been to Ghana, um, stranger being thrown at me, as was the case for Hartman in Ghana, it was Yovo. Giggled from behind mother's legs, whispered amongst vendors, and shouted at myself and the six HBCU undergrads as we bounced along in the back of a van, this, ba this van to be specific, we would just hear Yovo, Yovo, Yovo. So one of the students turns to me um, and she asks me, what does it mean? Can you ask what it means? I was the only one that spoke French besides the professor and you know, she wasn't exactly comfortable asking him that. Um, but Yovo was Fombe, a language I have yet to learn. So I turned to one of the Beninois grad students whom we worked with and I said, qu'est-ce que, que ça veut dire Yovo? Which means, what does that mean, Yovo? And he responds and I laugh because clearly my years of high school and undergraduate French have failed me. And I say, désolé, pouvez-vous répéter ça? Which basically means, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? And he switches to English. They call you white people, he says. It would be fruitless to debate which can hurt more, Obruni or Yovo, stranger or white person, but Obruni implied a distance and understanding of kin lost and it sort of felt like Yovo was a mockery. There was no space for kinship building, nor an acknowledgement that kinship could have ever exist, existed. Yovo was not a reflection of our language or our habits or her plastic REI pants that swished obnoxiously each day as we walked to and from the field site. Yovo was an evaluation of us, a calling out, a reckoning, that somehow, despite the fact that in the United States we were reminded day in and day out of our blackness, here we were white. While this realization was certainly difficult for the students as well as myself, I realized that what it meant was not that connection was impossible, it meant connection needed to be built. There was no prerequisite understanding of experience that could be relied on, no automatic pass into the inner circle, only an opportunity to learn. Now, I don't share this vignette to dishearten or dismantle any individuals or collective spiritual, ancestral, or other ties to the continent, but instead I offer it to pointedly deconstruct the black, mo black monolithic notion through firsthand account. Though I did not arrive in Benin expecting any form of literal kinship, Yovo both asserted and affirmed for myself as well as those other black students, the empirical non-existence of a monolith. But this was not where the learning stopped. Our first days in Benin were a deluge, both literally and figuratively, literally in that we were there during the rainy season, so it rained a lot and figuratively in that any and all conscious or subconscious understandings we may have had of West Africa were shattered with new information, both verbal and visual. As this event sort of seeks to address and redress, for many Americans, Africa is presented as a rather monolithic continent of sweeping savannas and small villages. For context, this photo that's on the screen right now is not even of West Africa. This is of um, Maasai villages, which are in Kenya. Um, but Cotonou really works to dispel this notion of what America is presented as a black monolith all at once. So this is just a picture of Cotonou and its location. Um, Cotonou is a port city on the south coast of Benin with a population of over half a million. 
It immediately dispels notion of, notions of Africa as a desolate continent and instead affirms the fact that West Africa has been and is a site of intense urbanization. While the economy is rooted in palm oil, brewing, and textiles, among other industry, historically this city played a large role in French automobile manufacturing, and that has contributed to its westernized layout and appearance. That being said, there are many aspects of this city that present a more Afro-modernist perspective on urban lifestyle. To exemplify this, I'm actually going to take a brief look at the town of Gonvi. So if we see here, Cotonou is located on a coastal strip between Lake Nokwe and the Atlantic. And it's bisected by a French built lagoon called the Lagoon of Cotonou. Um, and much of, every, much of the everyday life of Cotonou's inhabitants is defined by these interactions with the water. And if we move to focus on Lake Nokwe itself, we find Ganvi. Established in the 16th and 17th centuries by the Tofinu people as a means to escape France slave raids, Gonvi's population today is in the tens of thousands and its economy is based in tourism as well as fishing and fish farming. The families of the fishermen sail south to Le Grand Marché de Dantokpa, which is the main market in Cochinou most days to sell their stock. An overly Western perspective on this town might understand it as a village or otherwise desolate space, when in fact it exemplifies the ways in which cities and surrounding urban and suburban areas function across the world. When discussing non-Western spaces, academics, and I find myself guilty of this at times as well, often refer to these cities and their associated suburban or rural areas using the language of centers and hinterlands, wherein the center is often seen as both the economic and cultural cradle of a region, which exists off of some sort of symbiotic or even at times I would argue parasitic relationship with their respective hinterlands. I instead offer a perspective in which the center and the hinterland, the city and its suburbs, are both creators of a cultural of culture and economy that can simultaneously produce and cultivate each aspect of life for themselves as well as their counterpart. And while the use of this language of, and while the use of language such as you know center and hinterland may prove useful for academic discussion or schematic understandings of the region, we have to really remain conscious of the ways in which this language works to other non-western urban and suburban areas. That being said, and while I know that the focus of this event is on African cities, I have to be honest, for the majority of the trip, we were not in one. Instead, we were in the cornfields of Saklo village. So Saklo is just to the southeast of Boacan, probably right around there. Um, and those are the cornfields on the right. <laughs> on the surface, Saklo perhaps presents much more like the images of West Africa we have been fed our whole lives. Goats and chickens roam freely and much of the community relies on subsistence-based farming using what they can for their own sustenance and selling the rest at local markets or food stands in order to purchase what they cannot provide for themselves. That being said, this more rural space can be read through another lens in which the practice of subsistence farming and plastered mud brick homes are not just a manifestation of rurality, but also and perhaps instead a continuation of ancestral tradition. And speaking with Saklo resident, um, namely the village chief, he and I got really close by the end of the trip, uh, we can be seen here pouring libations in anticipation of our excavations. They deeply valued the fact that they were where their ancestors had been for centuries, doing in many ways the same thing that their ancestors had done for centuries. They expressed something that I had not ever really codified for myself, and that I, I would say that that's the privilege of indigeneity, or you know, the comfort of knowing that you are where you came from, which is not something we can all say for ourselves. In many ways, our excavations were funny to them, especially him. Um, we were only confirming things they already knew and they would readily tell us. Nevertheless, we excavated in the fields of Saklo for the better part of three weeks. The excavations were pr a preliminary study on Dahomey and residential areas. Prior to this, um, any work focusing on that time period, which is the 19th century and prior, has often paid little mind to residential areas, instead favoring larger palace and royal complexes. And just for some archaeological context, by preliminary study, I mean that there were no massive trenches opened in the earth, as one might imagine, given the way that archaeology is often represented. But instead, we did hundreds of shovel test pits, often referred to as STPs, which you can see me digging on the right. And they are literally just the width of a shovel. And you go down until you hit sterile subsoil, which in the case of this village and for the majority of West Africa is sort of this like hard red clay. Um, and then the contents of those STPs were then used to, to, to statistically analyze which areas of the fields had the highest density of artifacts. 
you might be wondering how we even ended up in these fields in the first place. Like how did Dr. Monroe know that this cornfield of the dozens of cornfields we passed would be one that might give us insight into the region centuries ago. And for that, we're gonna take a look at some trees, specifically baobab trees. So that's a huge baobab right there um, in the foreground of the photo. The entire region is spotted with trees. There are teak trees, mango trees, palms, but at this site, there were, a very, there were a few very large baobab trees that were at least a century old. And this is where that discussion of learned cultural conscience comes into play again. Um, Professor Monroe had the cultural content, conscience that these trees don't grow without human cultivation. They're not endemic to the region and fauna would probably trample or eat the saplings because before they became fully fledged trees. Additionally, in Vodun, which is the predecessor to voodoo tradition, the trees function as a spiritual connection to ancestors. So to see such large baobabs on the landscape isn't just simply an ecological point of intrigue, but can be read as a sustained deep history between people and their landscape, both literal and spiritual. Though preliminary, our work confirmed a long-term history of the habitation, which the chief knew in the region and gradually moved across, that had gradually moved across the landscape, most likely as a product of farmers adjusting the positioning of their fields and homes as soil waned in fertility, which is sort of in a manner similar to the European medieval feudal system of farming. And what's more, the preservation of tradition was only affirmed by the residents, which can be seen here in this photo, where a young boy who had spent all three weeks excavating with us brought one of his mother's old cooking pots to show how the very artifacts that we were pulling out of the ground resembled the ceramics that were still being used today. Though I could go on about our time in the field because archeology span truly is my passion, <laughs> I'll return again to the theme of cities, in this case, the historic and present day quote unquote center of Abome. So here's a map once again, this is Boacan, which is the urban area that was right next to Saklo, which is where we were digging and then Abome is to the west of that. Um, Abome is located just west of Boacan, as I said, and established in the 17th century as the capital of the kingdom of Dahomey. Abome boasts a complicated history, history much of which, which has been misconstrued in recent pop culture. And just for clarity reasons, I'm going to come out and say it. This is the part where I'm talking about the woman king. Um, before we delve into that history to the extent that I'm able to in such a short period of time, sorry, before we delve into that history, um, I just wanted to first talk about and address the notions and discussions of betrayal that often arise when talking about um, African participation in the slave trade. First and foremost, I'd like to note that no such language is used when we talk about historic empires of Europe. The language of kinship or brothers and sisters is rarely, if ever, utilized when discussing, say, you know, like the French fighting the Germans or any other European conflict, despite the fact that in the present day, all those groups would be considered white or you know, of the same race. So the fact that this language is employed when discussing intertribal warfare and slavery in West Africa points to a racialized and in my opinion, rather infantilizing view of West African tribal divisions. In order to understand this history, we must pay the same respect to tribal borders and divisions as has historically been given to other Western forms of nationhood. That being said, the Dahomean Empire did grow in power through the economic benefits of the slave trade. And while popular media, the Woman King, would like to portray the slave trade as something that ended firmly at the hands of the empire, specifically in the movie, sorry, spoilers, um, King, they say that it was King Gezo who reigned from 1818 to 1859. The practice did in fact continue. Um, and it was actually his son, King Glele, um, whom was in power at the time of the raids in which the members of Africa Town would have been captured. Despite this inconsistency, the Agogie, who are sort of the main subject of that film, and they're an all-female regiment, portrait, um, were in fact pivotal to the many of the empire's military campaigns, notably, and one that was alluded to in the film, um, against the Oyo. And just here, I'm just showing you that this I don't have a pointer. I don't know why I'm moving my mouse. Um, but the Dahomean Empire is over here and Oyo sort of spreads into Nigeria. Um, and they, the Oyo were a Yoruba group that presided over the regions to the Northwest of them. And the Ogoje were sort of integral in fighting that group. So sort of what the attraction of modern day Abome is aside from you know that history of warring is the palaces, which are now a UNESCO protected World Heritage Site. And though they mainly serve as a tourist attraction in the present day, they still hold major symbolic importance to the country and royal family. This past summer, while we were there, 
we went to go visit the palaces and luck we were lucky enough to witness parts of the coronation ceremonies surrounding the installment of the new king Behanzin. Though present day Abome is not as large of an economic labor center as it once was, it still holds match massive cultural significance for the Dahomean identity, which many of the present day Beninwa identify with. And this is, I'm just gonna show you one of the many dances performed by kin based groups that we were able to watch from the crowd, all performed to honor and celebrate the new king. So hopefully you can hear it as well as watch it. Let me know if there's any problems. Madison, we can see it, but we can hear it, just so you know. Oh, I just saw that there's no volume. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't know if I know how to fix that. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, okay, so we're just gonna keep going. Um, I guess for those of you that were in the presentation just prior to this, it is that sort of percussive group singing along with um, drumming that is being performed. So then we can move on. So the final city that I'm gonna discuss today is that of Wida. I But before we do that, I think it would be really fruitful to take a moment here to think about what Abome, this space that I just showed you, meant for so many West Africans who didn't see it as a place of celebration or reverence, who passed through it as they were taken to the coast, as prisoners of war, children, kidnappees, villagers unable to pay tax or tribute, the list goes on. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a picture of what I'm about to describe to you. So we can just, I think it would be valuable to take a moment and either close your eyes or just lean back from the screen and just listen as I describe sort of this monument and what it might mean. In Abome, there's a 10 foot high pile of stones that now lies within the perimeter of a high school. Though the date of this mound's initial construction is unclear, it grew in seasons for decades. The mound was part of a ritual, one in which captives stolen from, their hinterland, from the hinterlands of Benin and farther were made to each add a stone to the pile, contributing to a visual representation of the sheer power of the Dahomean empire at the time. The captives made to throw these stones, subsequently constructing this visual census, were not a complete representation of those kidnapped. These individuals deemed, the individuals deemed by the empire to be of some sort of certain value, whether due to their skilled craft experience, religious knowledge, or potential for espionage, among other things, were already separated, bound to directly serve the empire. Therefore, this mound represents those en route for the coast. Oral histories tell us that this act of stone throwing followed by a circling of the mound three times was supposed to be seen as an act of forgetting, forgetting their origins, their hometowns, their families, and even their names. Despite the potential emotional benefits of this forgetfulness, we know this to be untrue. After this ritual, the captives would then head south on foot to Wida, the port city, which is right there. Oh. The slides are jumping all over. There we go. The city, Wida, grew around trade, namely of people, and the forts of the French, British, Dutch, and Portuguese are a harsh reminder of the ways in which European capitalism exacerbated tribal fact fractures and warring states to serve their own desire for free labor. As such, much of Wida's economy does surround the history of slavery. Beyond this, however, it is also home to Le Temple du Piton, or the Python Temple, a space open to the public that invites us to learn about the practices of Vodun, the predecessor to Voodoo. Though a tourist attraction, it's also a site of spiritual significance. Practiced by the Aja, Ewe, and Fon people of West Africa, Vodun is more than these toothless pythons believed to be protectors of ancient kings. It is a religion rooted in ancestral and deity worship. Despite the from time to time, perform performative exoticism of the temple in which attendants offer to tourists a chance to take photos with the serpents around their neck in exchange for money. Beyond its walls lies perhaps, at least in my opinion, the most spiritually powerful site in all of Benin, the beaches of Wida. City streets lead to long stretches of sand, which then lead to the sea. Walking across the beach that in any other context might seem like a tropical getaway, you're struck by the gravity of the fact that so many have taken this walk before, 
but this is where their last footsteps fell on their home comp continent. Lita presents perhaps the most grotesque exemplification of the center hinterland dynamic that I mentioned earlier on in this talk, at least historically. This was the parasitic manifestation of that structure, the exploitation of the hinterland. But rather than the garnering of crops or precious metals or any other type of good, it was lives. And finally, to tie it back to my personal research, this was the shore from which 162 years ago, the Clotilda embarked for Mobile. So those are some cities in Benin. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for questions now, whether that be about my research, the excavations in Benin, my experience in Benin, my experience in Alabama, whatever you'd like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madison, for this very important and informative talk. Um, yes, we have now opened up for questions. If you have any questions for Madison, now is the time. Um, I see a hand up. Would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, please. Thank you for taking the question. My, my name is uh, Inumi Duno Bikoye. I'm actually from Mobile, Alabama, born and raised. And my family is a member of the Peter Lee Gumpa um, property, which is in African oh, town. Oh my goodness. Some of those artifacts mm -hmm. are from the Peter Lee house. That's amazing. So, yes. So the fireplace I know is the only, is to my understanding, the only standing artifact on the property, but mm -hmm. it's good to know that there are others. What I wanted to know was in your digging of the test pits in Benin, did you see any similarities between what you found on my family's property? Yeah, And absolutely. I'd like to talk to you further offline after this because yeah, I too- Yeah, I, I, can, I can send my email in the chat, absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, for anybody who doesn't have any sort of background context on what we're talking about, Peter Lee was one of the founding members of Africatown and the chimney of his house is actually still standing there even though the rest of the area is sort of just, you know, grassy now. Um, and so the excavations that were done in Africatown on the Peter Lee house were actually done in 2010 um, by a professor named Neil Norman. Um, he was from William and Mary and it's, kind of unclear to me what happened after those excavations, but they were sort of put in curation facilities and never you know, analyzed. So this summer I ended up going back to Mobile. Well, not, yeah, I had been to Mobile before, but I had never seen the artifacts. I went back to Mobile and I was like, I will take on the job of counting all these artifacts because they deserve to you know, have names assigned to them, be fully analyzed so we can see what we can garner from that. And the STPs in Sacklo were super preliminary. So you saw, we did a couple hundred of them. And most of what we were finding there was trash pits. So it'd be these large areas where broken pottery and things like that were dumped. Whereas in the Peter Lee context, from what I've been able to see so far, I'm not fully done with the anal analyzing of the artifacts. Um, there seems to be less of a trash pit style of accretion of the materials, but something that I did notice is that there seemed to be a pretty broad spread of ceramics across the landscape, which was similar to what happened with ceramics in Benin. And it's sort of believed, I don't know if you've ever potted a plant where you crushed up an old terracotta pot, put it in the bottom of the plant to aerate the soil. But the chief was telling me in Benin that that was part of their practice. Like old pots would go mostly into these trash pits, but then they might be taken out to help aerate the so soil for farming. And I'm really interested in sort of understanding how the people in Africatown, including Peter Lee, might have lived off the land and not fully engaged with sort of, you know, the consumer capitalist economy of Mobile. And so I'm going to do future excavations, but I'm going to try and see if those well, I hope to do future excavations. I have to ask your family, but I'm sort of interested in wondering if that crushed up pottery across the landscape might have been for a similar attempt at aerating the soil in order to make it more fruitful. Um, because in, when talking to so many descendants of the members of Africatown, they've talked about how their grandparents will talk about, you know, living off the land, eating from fruit trees, catching a lot of their own food. 
And so I want to see if those food based practices and the sort of exemplification of their own sovereignty and autonomy is visible both in Benin and then in similar ways in Mobile. I hope that answers your question. And I will put my email in the chat right now. And I will do the same. Let's stay in touch, please. Absolutely. Um, anybody else has a question that you'd like to ask? Uh, Madison, I'm curious um, about your stay in Benin. Um, you shared that when you went, when you are arriving, um, they referred to you as white. And, um, you know, there was no connection. It seemed there was no connection between you and the students, the whole group with the people of Benin. I'm curious to know if that changed and your feelings changed um, towards the end of your trip. Yeah, absolutely. I think it definitely did change as we made, you know, emotional connections with people. And I think that for myself, as somebody who's light skinned and biracial, um, these were not, you know, these are discussions that I've also had in the States, but there were, you know, some dark skinned female students who felt sort of very offended by the use of the term Yovo. And I don't necessarily want to speak to them. I mean, speak for them. But I think there was this understanding that they, and a lot of them are from the South where many HBCUs are. So they were coming into this region really like hoping for this connection of like how they had imagined the continent to be. And so I think that was really hard for them. But I think a moment that I didn't include cause I'll speak about it, but I didn't include it in the PowerPoint cause it's rather intimate um, was when the girls decided to get their hair braided. And I sort of came along, I ended up getting my hair braided because the lady who was braiding all of our hair told me that my braids looked awful and I needed to let her redo them. And I was like, I've heard that before. Um, but I came along initially sort of to just be like a translator. And I think to have such a sustained amount of time where we were not expected to talk about what work we were doing. We weren't expected to be archeologists. We were just expected to be girls and being in the space space with these other girls and despite myself having to be the translator for all the conversations you know the familiar sort of teasing that goes on in a lot of these spaces I think was a moment that really fostered connection for us and I was like maybe maybe that's the international aspect of all this teasing because <laughs> anytime that something was too spicy for me I would hear, there would be no end to how I couldn't handle spicy food or different things like that and I think the teasing about those differences and playfulness about those differences, as opposed to sort of trying to establish that there was no difference or trying to ignore that there was a difference was much more valuable and connecting than trying to force connection. Um, I see a question about the chat. The chat and then we'll get to you adding Nika. Um, then, okay, so I'm just gonna read it out. Um, Chastity said, I'm really interested in the geography of memory. You mentioned the memorialization of the slave trade. Are these memorials found in urban areas? And how does the public appear to interact with these memorials as part of an urban or not space? Yeah, absolutely. So the Porte de No Futuro, the gate of no return, is on the beaches of Ouida. And obviously from the images that I showed where you're kind of looking out at the ocean, it looks sort of secluded, but right behind it is just the streets of Ouida. So that, that one is in a very urban area. The only other memorial that I really saw about the slave trade was actually super far north. So even more north than Bolacan and it's in the Bonte region, um, which we visited as that's the region that it was believed that Cujo um, came from. So they actually have a bust of Cujo in that region that is the exact same carving as a bus that is in Africatown, Alabama. But it was very interesting because even when we were there and we were speaking to people being like, oh, we know there's, there's this statue, there's this bust, you know, where is it? 
some people were like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know. Like, I don't necessarily, I can't speak for how internally the history of the slave trade is discussed, but there definitely was more emphasis on the fact that the slave trade had ended there rather than the fact that it also had necessarily existed there prior to its ending. So that was very, and, and that bus was in a super rural area. And so we finally, we were talking to this guy who like had a couple goats and he was like, oh, it's up that hill. And we were like, okay. And we ended up walking up the hill and finding the bus. Um, okay, next question. I don't know who's next. Um, Adeninka has a question. Would you like to ask your question? Please? Um, yes, it's, it's not so much a question, but um, uh, more of a comment. You know, um, on, on this term, Yovo, I actually uh, lived in Benin for um, two years. And uh, that experience of uh, being Black, especially if you're, you know, you know, have any kind of pan Africanness, uh, non narrow Black nationalist leanings, um, you know, uh, going to Benin, going to Africa is almost like. Um, a pilgrimage, you know, the way, you know, a, a Muslim goes to um, Mecca. Um, um, and, and to be uh, referred to as Yovo, when you find out or, or when it's interpreted as white person, you're like, what? You know, but um, what I came to understand is that uh, uh, it's a, there is a much more nuanced definition uh, that, uh, Yovo actually means more like, um, at least my experience and understanding and sort of like trying to study this issue, is that it means it has more to do with a uh, foreigner or say, for example, a local person, uh, someone born and raised there who, you know, walks around in a suit and, um, and a briefcase, you know, someone can say, ah, to say, to say Yovo, you know, you, be, you, you behave like, you behave like a foreigner, like a, like a, like a, you know, a rich person from the West of some sort, you know, and um, they also have a term like that in, um, in Yoruba land, Oyebo, you know, or also in East Africa, they, they, they have a term that um, I, for, I forget, I'm not sure if it, I, I, I think it, 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 it's sort it's of the same way. Huh? Is it Mozongo? Yeah, Mozongo. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, the more time that I spent in Benin, one of the most, I, I went from being offended by the term to one day being so happy that someone called me a Yovo in, in a very strange context. I was uh, in a village and, you know, so uh, you have some cases where people, uh, bleach their skin. You have this kind of thing. I myself am a little bit uh, light skin, but uh, of course, no, no bleaching. And I was riding on a motorbike and someone screamed at me, hey, Yovo. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm being accepted as a local now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so all this kind of uh, different uh, psychological uh, uh, sort of experiences. I just wanted to add that to no, that's super, that's super valuable and interesting. I think, I think we were all taken aback in the car because um, Angelo, the Beninois student who explained it to us, he was so frank and matter of fact, like they're calling you white people. <laughs> You're like, what do you mean by that? But I think to also understand it as foreigner and understand how, you know, maybe in Angelo's mind, foreigner and Yovo and foreigner and white person were equivalent even is a super sort of interesting way to sort of deconstruct that and think about what it means when it's said in a derogatory way versus what it means when it's said in a teasing way and sort of like pull out all the different meanings that it could have. So thank you. Um, okay, I was just seeing if there are any more questions. Um, I don't see any in the chat. Yeah, I just maybe wanted to add to what Adeninka shared um, um, to say that I'm from East Africa and 
like she said, we call um, foreigners muzungu, but it's in no way derogatory, you know. It's just a term that's used to, you know, to call a foreigner. It's a name for a foreigner, but um, yeah. it's not derogatory at all. I think I I think that when I say derogatory, I don't think that's necessarily the right word. I think the issue that arose for a lot of the HBCU students specifically, because there is a large culture of embracing a Pan-African identity at HBCUs was this idea, as you said, of like the pilgrimage and this idea that I am in some way returning home. So then to return home and be called white person or foreigner or stranger, you're like, I feel a stranger in the place that is my home. And then I went to the place that I was thinking of as my home and I'm also be called being called stranger. And so I think that, I mean, I could talk about that term for like years just because it's so interesting the way that it is said versus the way that it can affect people when they hear it. Yeah, and I think it's it's a language issue, right? I mean, you have to, you have to understand the language. I, I mean, it's like, especially embarrassing when you first get there and you're with, white people and they're saying Yovel and you point to the white people and go, hey, they're calling you Yovel, like I'm here. And they said, no, 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 we're calling you. All of you. Yovel. Yeah. But, but with time, right, yeah. you start to understand what it means. And, and I personally interpret it now. I mean, it does mean white people. It does mean foreigner. And it also means someone with access to bourgeois amenities that I don't have. <laughs> You know, I think that's a really valuable point. I think that's a really that valuable day, point. Though. That day, Inca, I think, I'm sorry to jut in, but I thought I should say that that day, Inca, is the point. And it's really important that when we send African-American students to Africa, we prepare them for that point, that they be aware that Africans, yes, will recognize that they are Black, but they see them as a different class of Blacks. And that's what they mean when they use the same term as they used to for white folks. It does not mean that your blackness is invisible or that they are not uh, accepting you. They are simply saying, you're better than most of us here. That's really what, that they're, what that's about. I think that the importance of that preparation is super, yes. super valuable. Because I, I think for a lot of it, I keep hearing it from black students who, go, who come from different universities all across the country. They go to Africa and then that's an affront to them. The bam, it hits them in the face. But it's because we're not preparing them and letting yeah. them understand that, yes, they will recognize you. In the earlier session, we we're talking about the importance of black musicians, black artists, uh, black athletes, because we recognized they were black and we took that as pride to, to fight against apartheid, to say, if you're saying that Muhammad Ali is black and you're saying he's inferior, how is he winning all the fights? You know, if, if, if you're saying Louis Armstrong is unable, how is it the greatest jazz musician? You see, so we were taking black excellence from the United States as a weapon to resist the notion that blacks were incapable. So, so we need to uh, clarify that for our students so that they, they, they will understand in, and interpret what happens on the African cont uh, continent in context. Yeah, it, tr it truly was amazing. I think I, I was surprised by it, but I wasn't really shocked by it. But to see the way that some of these students shut down upon hearing that, yeah. I I was like, you were not, a, the, the vision that you were sold of everyone coming to the shores and holding hands and hugging you and saying, welcome home is not going to happen. And that is okay. That is not what's supposed to happen. So well, another, part, another part of that is that the Pan-African orientation that people in the West, African-Americans, people of African descent sent that, they, that they have in the West, is not necessarily readily existent in Africa because no one is talking about Pan-Africanism at that level anymore. You see, we, we come at it from an academic point of view, knowing who Malcolm X is, knowing who Marcus Garvey was, knowing who Kwame Nkrumah was, knowing what they stood for, knowing what uh, Booker T. Washington stood for. The general population of people anywhere in the world does not know, okay? So when you have a Pan-African persuasion, it doesn't mean that when you reach Africa, everybody will have that Pan-African persuasion. Not that they are opposed to it, but the concepts are just not front and center to their thinking and to their, to their sense of identity formation. And, and you know, I, I think also as African-Americans, we have to also recognize the ways in which 
we are culturally white, you know, especially when we're in Africa. You know, and it doesn't mean we're white physically, but culturally, we 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 we're white. You know what I'm saying? We're not used to, you, you know, I mean, I experienced this with, you know, goats in the in the back of the um, of the uh, the taxi, you know, and, and I'm freaking out and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm a white woman. You know, who am I to tell these people that they shouldn't have a goat or chickens in the in, in the in the back of, you, you know, so it's awakening. You have to stay there and you have to, you know, wake yourself. And, and I think it's our job to show people who we really are. Right. I, I mean, and, and I mean, that was my experience after a while, you know, so I'm sorry. This is just uh, a, a um, uh, how should I say, very important conversation. And uh, uh, so sorry. That's OK. I think. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Isaac, as well. Olenka, did you have a question? You're muted right now. I know our time is fast, but thank you so much, Madison. I just have a quick comment question, kind of. I, I understand that sometimes, you know, when people refer to people as, you know, these terms, Oyibo, I'm a Nigerian, by the way. Mm -hmm. And when Nigerians see a white person like Oyibo, or they call them Oyibo, like Adeyinka said, but then there is a kind of like privilege that is attached to that mm -hmm. even in the country itself, right? So uh, that is, you know, that black, uh, you know, people who aren't white in the country don't get to experience. So for instance, when I went to do my research, I was coming from the United States. I didn't want anyone to know that I was coming from the United States. And then that took me a lot of, you know, I had to go through a lot of loopholes and I had to go through a lot of, you know, um, you know, strict guidelines to be able to get what I wanted. However, I was sitting in the office waiting to be seen, right? And this white lady just came in and there were like four or five people accompanying her. And as soon as the lady at the door saw her, she was so excited. Hey, you boy, you boy, you boy. And then this lady just went right by me, went upstairs and went to get whatever it is that she came for. So that privilege, I was wondering if, you know, of course, you you think, I mean, you know that you are part of the people, right? But they don't see you like that. So I was wondering if you you experience that kind of privilege just by the fact that, you know, your your skin color, you know, mm. the way you associate, I mean, the way you identify that they are not aware of. I just wonder if you you acquire some level of privileges that way. I I have to imagine that we did. I have to know that we did. And I think that in the few times that we were probably, you know, in public or at a restaurant and interacting with, you know, other groups of people, I'm certain that we did. That being said, I think the other thing that sort of ties into that idea of privilege that happened is so many people, residents of Sacklow, thought it was so funny to see us, the privileged foreigners, digging in the dirt. Like, I think that they truly, to see these, to see the foreigners, the Yovo, that typically come in and walk through an area and are, you know, sort of coddled through their journey through the country to see us on our hands and knees in dirt. I think they actually found it very odd and funny because they were like, why would you do that? We're telling you what the history is. And we were like, we know that we know that you're right. We're only, we're only proving that you are in fact correct. So I think the, while I'm sure that in our moments in public, we did, we also spent very little time in larger public areas. And for the majority of the time, we were sort of just staying in the village. And there's like, um, there's a hotel that's in the village, which is not where we stayed, but like we would get lunch provided um, by Madame Daga, who's the one that sort of owned the hotel. And she would just sit there and laugh at us as we came in to eat our lunch, just covered in dirt. Meanwhile, like she had just gotten her nails done and she was like, silly white people, silly foreigners. Like, why are you coming here? You have all this money and you're still choosing to dig in the dirt. Like that makes no sense to me. <laughs> so yeah, it was sort of a double-sided coin there. Yeah, that's interesting to know. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really wanted to just appreciate, say thank you one more time for taking the time out of your day to listen to me and give a young academic a chance. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Madison, for sharing your work with us. Um, we wish you the best as you know you continue with your research.